I don't don't really want to say I'm bullish on the euro breaking down and hitting parity today against the US dollar because I think it is the first time in 20 years that the euro and the US dollar is one to one. But for me, it's kind of highlighting um, just how accelerated this fiat fiasco is collapsing. Uh, I think the European Union is still operating in negative uh, negative yield territory while the US is aggressively raising interest rates. Uh, you're watching the Japanese yen lose 30% of its value against the dollar over the past six months. The euro has lost 20 to 30% of its value against the dollar in the past you know, six to 12 months. I, I think it's just kind of highlighting how broken the fiat system is. Um, they can't normalize interest rates. They can't raise interest rates. We're living in the biggest debt Ponzi of all time. And I, I really, I think there's lots of indicators out there that show there's real stress in the system just from the US raising rates to what, they, what is it, 2%? Is federal funds not even at 2% yet? Um, like you're watching uh, liquidity in the mortgage backed security market dry up. You're watching liquidity in the treasury market dry up. Um, I think it's just kind of highlighting that. Powell's going to have to pivot pretty shortly and and when he does and when it, when the money printers come on and if the US has to also try yield curve control like Japan has tried and has failed in doing, um, I, I think it's going to really accelerate the timeline of everything and I kind of had the opinion for a long time, okay, maybe a slow transition's best, maybe a slow and gradual transition is going to be the least chaotic and it's going to cause the least pain. but. Um, I think recently I was listening to Knut Svan Home and he raised some pretty good points about uh, ripping the Band-Aid off quickly and just completely transitioning onto a Bitcoin system because the longer we're using fiat, the longer um, the poor people in society are suffering from inflation and they're having their wealth stolen. If you somehow force them onto some sort of quasi Bitcoin standard in the interim um, or if you force the world onto a quasi Bitcoin standard, I, I think it's going to be better for society and humanity. So I, I just everything happening around the world um, looks like it's happening at an accelerated rate. And I suppose that makes me bullish because I see Bitcoin as the only viable solution. Welcome to the show. My name is Kevin Andavani, the host of the Kevin Andavani Connection Show. And really excited to have Matthew Machinsky is back on my show after a very long time. Uh, Luke Mikic is also going to join us in a few minutes. And but we're just going to, you know, just take it off. Uh, and Matthew, you don't need no much introduction. Welcome to the show, by the way. And uh, just maybe still do give a short background. Like, you know, you are the co-founder uh, of, of the Crypto Voices podcast. And is there anything important like we should mention about your background? Because you, we already had you on my show. Sure, Kayvon, sure. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, I hope it all comes through. I'm, I'm getting a little bit of spottiness on the connection here, but um, I think it'll probably settle out after, uh, after some time. But, yeah, um, everything's fine, bro. Yeah. Yeah, at least you're hearing me fine. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I have a uh, podcast, Crypto Voices, had that running now for, um, uh, I guess, five years and um, started it uh, just before the ICO boom (laughs) of 2017 uh, and mostly focused on, you know, money, Bitcoin, economics and cryptocurrency. Um, And then from... Uh, the start of this year, I've been working on sort of trying to professionalize a little bit more uh, some data that I put out every quarter, uh, which is focused on the global uh, supply of base money, which is uh, basically all of the physical currency that central banks put out um, and all of their uh, so-called bank reserves, which is basically the other main liability line item on the central bank balance sheet. And those two items put together are base money or the monetary base. So I think I've done a decent job of putting that together. Kind of started as a hobby, now trying to professionalize a little bit. Um, Be doing some YouTube content uh, as well uh, shortly on some more, some more of that uh, type of data and just following that stuff. So yeah, that's pretty much what I've been doing, you know, following Bitcoin for a long time and definitely think it's going to be an important uh, factor in the world of of, uh, money as many do in the next few years. So it's going to be pretty interesting to watch. 
Yeah, and I noticed you, you, your website. I don't know. Is it a new website? Is it like super like polished, like uh, uh, the Porcopolis.io uh, co-founder? I said one of them is which I who also very highly respect is Fernando Ulrich. Uh, uh, is that like doing it together with him and some other co-founders? Yeah, so uh, Porcopolis is the uh, is the new brand that's kind of focused more on broader economic trends. It won't just be about Bitcoin. Uh, of course, I always followed gold and silver even before, um, but we'll have some different monetary things that we're following, different countries, um, just trying to bring data in in a nice, consistent, uh, systematic way. And that's for a while, I was going to do kind of like a dashboard function on the website uh, would be pretty interactive with users, but that from both a cost standpoint and I think a time standpoint won't serve myself or users well at this point. So I'm going to probably run a lot of it, the numbers and the research and the data I've collected myself on YouTube uh, relatively soon. So that's this Porkopolis brand and that's the monetary base quarterly updates, which I've done for four years now uh, is included sort of in that. Uh, the Crypto Voices podcast still stands as well. Um, Fernando Ulrich was my co-host for a couple of years at the beginning. Uh, and then now we have uh, two co-hosts. Uh, they've been with me for a little over a year now. Uh, Alec Harris, he works for a company called uh, Halo Privacy. Uh, and he uh, has very interesting clients around the world, both in crypto and not in crypto and very focused on privacy. So he adds a lot to the show. Uh, and then uh, Michelle, uh, also known as Keto, Keto Miner, um, one of the co-founders of Noddle as well as a co-host. So um, podcast is still going, going strong. And uh, that's, that's uh, this is sort of the two, two brands that we have running right now in this independent research that I'm doing. Awesome. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah. I'm just uh, screen sharing here. Yeah. Um, let me, you know, I have a, f a few questions because you made a, a pretty, very interesting thread on Twitter. Uh, it's about CBDCs. And I was like, wow, that, that, that's a, you know, super like concise uh, thread. There's just one point I want to discuss with you or I'm not sure whether I don't understand it or I'm not even sure whether I agree or disagree, but it doesn't matter. It just, I'm um, just, just trying to understand like the background of the, um, yeah, let's start off uh, with that question. Maybe, um, let's see how am I going to, yeah, so this is your, this is the thread about the CBDCs. Let me see, let me, where is it? There it is. Yeah, so um, you start off by saying, you know, there are two main, main reasons why your monetary pipe dream of a panopticon won't materialize anytime soon, if ever, because yeah, for me, also from my perspective, CBDCs means total control, absolute control, as they, you know, also Mr. Augustin Carson from the Bank of International Settlements also admits it. <laughs> but if you go down, uh, scroll down, because there, because I've been here and like listening to some other, whatever, experts or macroeconomists or you know people who 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 really dig into the cbdc because you talk about cbdcs and the cbpc which i first had to you know uh, i was like confused like what is cbpc what is, you mean like central bank physical currency uh the stock of it and you talk about i think that was a uh i think that was a moment of clarity for myself as well writing this post i, I <laughs> yeah that so let's start calling it cbpc it's yeah, been around for thousands of years as well. Well, hundreds of years, central bank, a thousand years, uh, physical uh, banknotes. Uh, Kublai Khan was the first actually to start that. But, um, you know, uh, it, it's it's sort of an ingest term, obviously, because CBDCs are just such this hype. But still, the main retail tool of a central bank is CBPC, which is the central bank physical currency. That's a cash and coin that we all sort of know and love mm -hmm. and hate. So, yeah, that's. That's where I uh, came up with that term. Which, uh, which, uh, which, by the way, I think you answer it in one of your replies to a, to a user, to a follower of yours. So the central bank physical currency, how much does it make? Like a third and the, and the rest, the two thirds is like as, uh, reserve assets, just, just for clarification for our yeah, listeners. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Just so, uh, just what I mentioned actually at the beginning as well, it's this sort of, uh, 
term that maybe a lot of people use, but they don't quite understand, but base money, monetary base, high powered money, reserve money, all of those things mean basically the main uh, monetary instruments of the central banks. A lot of times you hear about interest rates and bonds and money printing, but at the end of the day, you can count this stuff up. A lot of people don't like to do it. And uh, to my knowledge, I'm the only one that's actually done it on a consolidated basis, sort of globally. I've gone through 50 central banks, I've actually gone through more, but I have the top 50 central banks in the world uh, compiled here. Uh, if you look in the liability section of each central bank's balance sheet, there will be two main liabilities, which if you add those two up, it almost totals the assets. So it's basically the size of the balance sheet. And those liabilities are one, uh, this physical currency, CBPC, uh, that is the uh, banknotes, coins, things that we understand. And there's a small asterisk there, not to be too confusing, but uh, some legacy central banks, meaning like earliest central banks, like the Bank of England, Federal Reserve, uh, they don't have coins on their balance sheet. The coin sits with the treasury that has an old sort of thing has to do with gold and whatnot, but coins are so small anyway today, it's kind of nebulous. It still is calculated separately. Like I do include coins in the monetary base, but anyway, uh, it's, you know, banknotes are the main portion of that. So notes and coins are the, that's all the physical currency that we sort of understand. We hold in our wallets and our mattresses and safes and, and grocery store tills. Um, that is about one third of the monetary base. Uh, it used to be about 80%, you know, for years and years before, before the financial crisis, about 80%. So that was kind of normal central banking pre financial crisis. Uh, and then after the financial crisis, when you had these, this buzzword quantitative easing, uh, money printing from central banks, uh, this thing, this, this other thing, which is called the commercial bank reserve account, uh, bank reserves. Uh, sometimes it's called just the deposit account or the master account for a bank. That's the other main liability line item on a central bank's balance sheet. And that you can think of, it's basically the bank account for every bank in the system. So every bank has a main account, master account with central bank. And in that account, it's called uh, reserves. And that is actually the account that's most like liquid of the system. You know, if you think about. We don't, we don't really use checks in Europe, right? But still they use checks in the United States. Think about it, someone writes a check, one check from one bank to another bank. Uh, the way that that clears in a central banking system is it takes a long time. It goes up and up and up, you know, it takes a while to get back through the system. Uh, but eventually all of these liabilities and whether it's checks or Venmo or PayPal, all these different liabilities between banks will settle at the top. And of course they do this daily, but it takes time for each individual thing to get through the top of the system. Uh, that settles daily with, uh, there's a balance that settles daily between banks. And uh, that is, uh, that is, that is how they settle basically is with this, this master account or with this uh, reserve account. So um, bank reserves are crucially important for the banking system. You hear about it a lot. Uh, it's part of quantitative easing. Uh, it is quantitative easing. That is, that is you know, when, when new money is put into the system and the central bank buys an uh, exorbitant amount of bonds relative to what it bought before, it buys that by, uh, it's, it, it uh, buys the bonds from the banking system, it doesn't buy it from the treasury, it buys them from the banking system and then it will in return credit uh, that money into, uh, into the bank. So that's, that's the reserve account. And that right now is about two thirds of the monetary base. That's a great clarification. Yeah, yeah that, that's why I love, you know, your work. It's so, you know, it, you, it's still, I mean, I'm not a number guy, but but you give it like a really succinct and comprehensive overview of everything. So by the way, uh, Luke Mikic has just joined us. Uh, Luke, how are you doing? Hey, hey guys, nice yeah, to be sure. here. Sorry I'm late. <laughs> no, <it's okay. laughs> nice to meet you, Matt. I don't think I've come across you before uh, in person. So nice to meet you. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah, because I saw you guys were communicating via Twitter or you, 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 you asked a question, I think, Luke, and I thought, you know, maybe you have also some questions for, uh, for Matthew. So that would be good to connect, you know. <laughs> yeah, those charts you make um, over on the Crypto Voices website, they're amazing. And I was, um, I remember them in the back of my mind. I was writing an article. I was thinking, geez, that'd be amazing to have the uh, year on year monetary growth chart for all the different countries. I, I couldn't find them anywhere. So I, I hit you up on Twitter the other day. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, man. That's what I, that's, that's precisely what I have happened to have built out there. So <laughs> glad. To, uh, <laughs> we'll glad keep it up. They're great chats. Thank you. Okay, so before I forget my question, um, Matthew, so the, 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 the thing I wanted to ask you, in your Twitter thread about the CBDCs, you, you, and then you asked the question yourself, like where, would, where, could, so where could CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, steal market share? Okay. And then you follow up with the answer, the banks. You mean like, like commercial banks, right? And, and then you say, this won't work simply because CBDCs make ba banks less profitable. This is not a secret. It is already recognized in hundreds of papers. Here's the latest one, et cetera, et cetera. Now, my question is because I've always heard from other people, like other experts who talk about CBDC, like, oh, you know, the, the, the open or secret uh, intention of the CBDCs is actually to, you know, it's about absolute control, absolute centralization. And, but so why would they need, because the, the whole purpose, I the whole point is to, you know, have every human being <laughs> have a Fed account or whatever, a central bank uh, account. Why would you need the middle, the middleman? The intermediate, they just want to get, maybe they just want to get rid of the intermediaries, the, the commercial banks and just centralize everything because it's about absolute control. I don't know. Am I misunderstanding something or is this like something completely different what you're talking about? I don't know. Uh, the, the political aims of CBDCs, I think, are very different than the economic aims. Uh, that's why you will notice that most banks, if they talk about it, or bankers, they might be pretty cool to the idea because they don't really see a need for it because that's precisely the service that they do. They, you know, intermediate uh, not only credit, but, but also payments. And so the payment function of banks is huge. And when they intermediate payments, they have these things called deposits and whether it's a savings deposit or time deposit or checking deposit, uh, all of those deposits fund banks profitability, because as we know, that deposits, the liability side of the bank balance sheet, it's a commercial bank now, uh, not central bank. And on the asset side of a commercial bank balance sheet, they have loans. And so, um, Base money is also a part of banks' asset. Like base money, they hold in vaults. It's a very, very small percentage of the overall number that I talked about earlier. But um, yeah, they have base money on their balance sheets. They might have a little gold, actually. And then they, the vast majority of a commercial bank balance sheet is loans. And with those loans, they'll generate interest. So, uh, but the big funder of those loans is precisely its depositors. And it's a question of, you know, it, we don't have to talk about like fractional banking here, what, what not. I mean, it's just, it's banking. Uh, you match uh, liabilities from your depositors with your assets of your loans and try to make money. That's, that's just how banking works. So if those, and, and, and by the way, uh, the first reason that I put on the Twitter that is also important here because I tried to show how huge the CBPC, as we just talked about, the CBPC supply is, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's $9 trillion. It grows at 10% a year. It doubles every seven years. It's massive. You have no idea how big this is, really. I mean, because in the, in the developed world, we think we don't need cash so much or whatnot, but it's still huge. You know, world population only grows at a percent to a percent and a half percent, 1.5 percent per year. Whereas this uh, CBPC stock and reserves grow even faster, by the way, but the other part of the monetary base, but CBPC, central bank physical currency, grows at 10% a year. So, that's not going away anytime soon, no matter how much they want to say it is. And I use the example of India as well, because they demonetized, uh, they, they did replace with other supposedly more secure, uh, they had those, uh, those, uh, what is it called? Those glyphs, you know, that like the, the fancy things that are supposed to make the bank notes more secure and less, less, uh, less forgeable, less, uh, God, I can't even speak, less, less copyable, right? Where you can, uh, counterfeit counterfeit sword. Uh, they had all those things in India with these new banknotes, but still they, they collapsed the money supply almost in half in 2016. And now from that bottom, bottom point, it's like over three times higher. So ask yourself, even in India, it's a huge player. It's like sixth largest monetary base in the world. Well, maybe, yeah, I think it is. Um, no, it's not. It's, it's actually outside the top 10, but uh, it's, a, it's the fifth largest economy block all these different things I'm trying to, these rankings, but it's still, it's a massive economy, large monetary base, and they tried to control it. They tried to 
in 2016 really take the and and they use as a example more digitization in the economy more uh transparency less counterfeit less black market these are the words the buzzwords they themselves used uh, just trying to get physical currency outside out of you know drained from the economy and they couldn't do it it's just too important for low income trade uh low vol you know uh, the low volume trade you can say like low dollar amount roughly speaking trade and it's just very very important for uh, many many people so that was the point of the first reason it's just it's massive it's bigger than you can imagine and then so that means that this the cbdc stock it, it sits in the same place it's it's on this bank reserve cbdc a cbpc right and then cbdc it's going to be this third form of base money it's going to be a liability of the central bank so if central banking if it's cb uh DCs, there's gonna be this new retail money. If it's not going to take away, which is my claim, it's not really going to take away market share from uh, CBPCs, central bank physical currency, which is like $9 trillion. It's not going to cut into that. And central bank physical currency is flying high at 10% a year growth. And most of that, by the way, is in recent years, was even higher than that, because that was a 50 year compound growth rate that I gave 10%. In recent years, it's even higher than that. So it's not going to take away from that bucket. The only other retail bucket out there is the banking system. So that's the point about profitability. And it's in all the papers, like it's, they know it. Uh, it, it, it if you have a central bank digital currency, like an app that's with the central bank on your phone, and it, it's supposed to be cooler and better and more awesome than Venmo or PayPal or all these other bad banking apps, uh, you users, and they really do go to CBDCs that will drain that will drain the deposits of the banking system, which are the things that funds bank loans. It's just what funds banking. Um, so that would make banks less profitable. And that's, they, they know it. This is why you'll hear as well, I'm sure you've, hear, you've heard this, but a uh, standard recommendation for CBDC, CBDCs to start is that we limit it per person. There'll only be about, you know, you can have a thousand dollars equivalent of a CBDC to start at least. So we figure this out, right? They, they want to, they know that if, if it, if it really is supposed to be this great thing and you know, it's easier to use whatnot, which is debatable in itself, right? It's probably going to be hacked because, you know, central governments can't even run, you know, healthcare systems. How they can run a, you know, <laughs> retail, like digital monetary system. Uh, then, uh, it just, you know, it just follows that it's something that's probably overhyped probably not going to work that well and if it does it's going to take out profitability from the banking system so they they're they're already saying in all their papers yeah well we're going to have to limit it to uh you know thousand dollars per account okay gotcha okay mm -hmm. um feel free to follow up yeah if i'm i mean we can talk about it it's yeah interesting <laughs> Uh, look, before I forget, I was going to introduce you since you were popping in too late. Uh, you are the co-host of the Bitcoin Simple podcast, uh, right? Yeah, Bitcoin Made Simple. Yeah, Bitcoin Made Simple. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I have a few other questions, but um, look, uh, you can just, you know, chime in where, you know. Yeah, on CBDCs, I 100% agree with Matthew. I, I think they're really, really overhyped. Um, I think if you had asked me about CBDCs in 2020, just maybe two years ago or even 12 months ago, I probably would have had a very different opinion on them than I do now. I think in 2020, uh, they were saying, yep, the year that CBDCs are going to ship around the world is 2022. We expect CBDCs to be out in about 24 months, maybe 36 months, 2023 at you know the most. But you know, 2022 is here and I don't see many CBDCs around the world. Um, was it Lyle Brainard from the from the Fed this week came out and said, yeah, CBDCs in the US are still five years away. Um, so I, I agree with Matthew. I think um, I think central bankers are extremely incompetent. And if CBDCs are you know three years away or four years away or even five years away, um, I can't imagine what the adoption of Bitcoin will be in three or four years' time. So I, I think um, I think they're certainly kind of pushing a pretty big boulder up a very steep hill trying to roll out these CBDCs quickly. Yeah, and that physical stock of currencies will be all the time increasing, maybe doubled. So that's the thing that they're supposed to be chipping into, right? But mm -hmm. um, I just think, yeah, I think it's a very, like you said, it's a huge uphill battle there. 
And uh, one of the things I think you said was very interesting is that like, just, you know, yeah, just think about it in terms of months, 24 months ago, uh, they were saying all of these things. I, I remember, I always joke about this with Marty, uh, Ben, I, I should write this stuff down more because uh, I don't and I need, I need to start doing it. But I remember in 2018, I was on his show very early and I was cool on CBDCs then. And I thought the best thing that the U.S. would try to do, not the best thing, but the easiest thing for the U.S. to try to do was regulate stable coins because they were just starting then you know, on Ethereum. Tether was making noise with Bitfinex or whatever. But um, that seemed like a very easy, low-hanging fruit thing for them to regulate. And lo and behold, it's finally happening. Uh, I'm not saying it's bad or good or whatever, but um, stable coins work. They actually work and they are if you want to say that they work with certain, it could be high fees at certain times, but that's the thing that they'll easily try to regulate. And one more thing regarding the fed in particular is I think the fed would be the last person to want to jump on this because, you know, they have the biggest banking system in the world. It's the most profitable uh, dollar quote unquote work store value around the world, all these things. I just don't, you know, there's no upside for them to try to do this. And usually, you know, as we know with these high risk new, digital projects is there's you know, there's a lot of downside in early days. You have to suffer from hacks. You can suffer from all sorts of things. So um, I, yeah, I don't see the, the, the dollar jumping on that train anytime soon. That was a great call on uh, stable coins. Um, I actually think the United States is going to use right, stable yeah, coins. It's on its project. Sorry. Yeah, 2018. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, I actually think stable coins are going to be the solution to the petrodollar system breaking down. So you've watched USDC uh, just recently, BlackRock just took a $400 million funding stake in USDC. They're the company behind the largest, uh, well, sorry, they are the largest stable coin. BlackRock took the $400 million stake in Circle, the company, sorry. But essentially they just said, hey, look, BlackRock is the primary treasury reserve asset manager for USDC and they're mandating them to hold 100% US treasury bonds. So that's US debt. And I think it's very interesting that Tether, which was originally this offshore stable coin that was kind of running away from the US government, trying to be very um, not compliant. Just recently, they've come out in the past couple of months and they've changed their tune. They've said, yeah, you know what, actually, we're going to start selling a lot of this risky commercial paper that we hold and we're going to start buying more and more US treasury debt because it's safer. So I actually think it's interesting. You watch China, Europe, Russia all dump their US treasury bonds and US debt. And I think as Bitcoin kind of proliferates around the world, so do stable coins. And if those stable coins are backed by US treasury debt, that means uh, demand for US debt um, kind of doesn't instantly drop off a hill because all these countries like China, Japan, Europe, and Russia uh, are dumping US debt. But I can't believe you called that four years ago, Matthew. That's, that's yeah, a great that's call. And by the way, I mean, it, doesn't it make it also when they buy thing. U.S. Treasuries, the, the audibility, uh, the transparency is also, it, or the credibility is actually proven then on, on Tether's side. It, w is that a good point to make or? Yeah, no, it, yeah absolutely. Like Luke was saying, that's, that's absolutely what's happening. It's uh, not surprising to me that, that, you know, it's something that works. It's something that the government can get its hands on. The, the, the centralized entities that run these stable coins are right there. They know where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, even if they're, you know, started in the Caribbean, uh, they know that they're there. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's natural. Uh, and it's a good point, Luke, as well, about the petrodollar. I think another way to say that is the euro dollar, which basically means it's the same thing. It means dollar-based accounts held outside of the U.S. banking system. That's massive. That's a massive quantity of dollars that but no we don't know really how much any... right we don't know how much like yours i mean there is not really a specific can you put like a number and estimate so euro dollars were included in what is known as m3 which is the broadest money supply which would include all these deposits right they were included in that by the federal reserve until 2006 and then the fed interestingly two years before the financial crisis stopped publishing m3 and there were two very interesting things in m3 that absolutely had to do with the financial crisis. One was Euro dollars, which is just global money that's sloshing around in dollar form. And that was absolutely involved in the credit bubble. Absolutely. Um, and then the second thing was uh, repurchase agreements, repurchase agreements. And so repurchase agreements are um, 
banks use them uh, every day. It's 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 actually it's involved with this sort of as I was talking about earlier, settling between banks with the reserve account. They do that as well uh, by posting collateral of some of the bonds that they have, and you don't necessarily need to bank to be a bank to do that. So there is the sort of the banking system portion, which is sort of clear how big repurchase agreements are. But there is the outside the banking system uh, entities that are involved in the repurchase market. It's massive as well. Massive as well. So you're talking tens of trillions of dollars there as far as uh, both euro dollars and repurchase agreements combined. I don't know a number. Um, and, I, and I think really no one does. Uh, yeah. I've heard some pretty large estimates. I think there was an official paper on Euro dollars 2012 or maybe 2014. And they said it's like 14 or 15 trillion, but I've heard other people say it's north of a hundred trillion dollars uh, worth of us dollars out there. So that's actually larger than the amount of dollars circulating. Um, that's actually the, the fed admits to like the M3 money supply in the United States. Yeah, that's that's massive. A hundred trillion. I mean, wouldn't that would seem large to me? But it wouldn't surprise me. You never know how this stuff works. Uh, I, there are interesting numbers, though, that you can almost be sure that dollars are a huge amount of those. Like the Paradise Papers, Panama Papers. If you added all those up, like all of them, those recent sort of last five, ten years sort of papers where they you know offshore accounts. That was something like thirty trillion, uh, maybe twenty five trillion. If you added them all up. So yeah, and you compound that, you could absolutely get to a hundred trillion. That's mind boggling. No one actually. <laughs> yeah, even the banks themselves, the Fed themselves, they they don't have control of it. So interestingly, uh, stablecoins might play a role in shoring up, so to speak, uh, these markets, and it might actually make them more transparent. Might actually make. Uh, I I don't know. I again, we're Bitcoiners here, so I don't I don't have a particular like dog in that fight but um yeah that's where yeah you know what's interesting uh, matthew and luke um uh, you know when you listen to samson mao you know the ceo former uh, cso of blockstream and now uh, founder and C ceo of uh, jan3 for nation state bitcoin adoption he i mean he's a total advocate of of stable coins but he uh at the same time you know in a, <laughs> he says that stable coins are somehow i mean i'm just paraphrasing it's sort of more transitory it's uh, they're going to be either not be, uh, how, what do you say abolish not maybe abolish but they're going to go away or something. I mean, what do you make of that? Is that something like a, just for the transition to a hyperbitcoinization phase or where do you see where do you see that going uh, long term? Yeah, I don't I don't uh, well I don't necessarily know his views. Uh, I I would say generally um, I don't really know Samson, but um, I don't myself have much interest even in even how much nation state adopting a bitcoin there is uh talk about this a little bit in our podcast you know again i'm not i'm not virtue signaling here but i just don't i think it's great if you can find freedom and you can find interesting way of life in el salvador whatever uh certain places around the world uh, but there's a lot of issues i see with sort of relying on a state that you know says they got bitcoin for the people and whatnot but you know we just seen this story so many times of uh, you know, same thing happening with, right now with Russia. Like they're they're got the screws on them, and and we are super uh, super pro Ukraine here. I mean, I do not want Ukraine sovereignty to be compromised uh, because of the crazy man's agenda. Uh, I know a lot of people are worried about nuclear threats and whatnot, but you know, nobody's talking about invading Moscow. We're talking about what Moscow did to Kiev. So uh, these types of things like dictators do, I really don't like. And you know, I talk about this a lot. Uh, you know thousand years from now, maybe we'll all have private property, private insurance, private defense contracts, all these things. But right now, uh, I think sovereignty for an individual in a country is very important. Uh, what I necessarily not a fan of is like, if we, uh, why did I bring up Russia? Because recently they've got the screws on them and they're making a lot of positive, positive crypto statements, right? They're going to lower taxes on crypto. They're going to make crypto more legal than it was or whatever you know so these types of things i'm not necessarily a fan of because i don't um i just don't i don't agree with the principle that you know that there's if you look behind there you're seeing actually you can find a lot of oppression in the same countries that claim to uh, 
either adopt or be using Bitcoin. And, and this is not unknown, right? I mean, like North Korea, you know, there's a lot of Iran. I mean, you know, there's a lot of places where we in the West or the liberal democracies uh, might say, you know, and I have nothing against Iran at all. That it's great that they're using it. Absolutely great. Um, but there, there might be some human human rights consequences there. Definitely, yeah. More important. More important. Yeah, uh, it's always you know the people suffering at the end. You know, from all the sanctions and embargoes. You know, the people. I, I mean, I you know, I feel with the people always. I mean, I'm not a. I don't care about nations' borders or you know patriotism or all this bullshit. Um, but hey, uh, let's tie this into the Bank of International Settlements because I think it hasn't been talked enough. But uh, there's this guy, you know, who pushes for nation state Bitcoin adopt sort of as a bottom up approach in Peru. And he sent me this the screenshots or other, you know, tweet, uh, tweets. Bank, you've heard it, you know, Bank for International Settlements to allow banks to keep 1% of reserves in Bitcoin. I mean, is that something you think is a sort of a uh, self made Trojan horse or what? what what do you make of this? Yeah, I saw that. I didn't look into it as much. That it also, I think it's not necessarily reserves, but it's uh, capital. It, it will it will affect their capital requirements, maybe, um, which is a slightly different thing, actually. But uh, the uh, I don't know what I think of it yet, honestly, because um, if. If central banks, we, Fernando used to say it on our show, actually, which is his uh, econ professor used to say it, uh, Jesus Suerto de Soto, like the central bank that uh, would hold too much gold or the central bank that holds too much Bitcoin is kind of like the virgin prostitute, right? It's just, it's something that is doing something that is really counter to what it uh, says it's needed for, right? If we, if we just need gold or Bitcoin, then you don't need the central bank to hold it. It doesn't doesn't do anything there. You can have regular banks do it in a free system. So um, yeah, maybe Trojan Horse. I, I don't. I just don't know yet. I got to keep looking at it. I don't know, like maybe the ripple effects or whatnot. But uh, it's uh, it could be like it, it could happen. Uh, we interviewed uh, Tyler Jenks. Rest in peace. He uh, a couple years ago, and I remember he made this statement like. Uh, just like they did with with gold, where you remonetize the dollar. Of course, they went the other way. They made people that had gold, you know, poorer. But just like they did with gold, they could do the same with Bitcoin, where it would actually go the the other way, positive for Bitcoiners. They might give you a price that you can't refuse. Like they might monet, you know, in an effort to shore up all those dollars and to shore up everything. They say, okay, we are going to have the dollar. It's a certain percentage backed by Bitcoin. It's going to be this price, and if it's at this price. It's obviously going to be higher than the market, and it's just going to shoot up, and everybody that has Bitcoin is going to be instant millionaires and all these things. And he was just using that as an as an example of something that could happen in the future if like inflation gets too out of control. I guess it's just possible that that could be a uh, monetization scheme that Bitcoin becomes like entrenched in the nation state. But that's not really anything that I see as exciting. Obviously, none of us I think see it as exciting. Like we don't want Bitcoin's value to be tied to anything that any one central bank says, certainly not the U.S. Federal Reserve. So, uh, you know, I, I just I'm not I'm not necessarily seeing it, but I don't know enough to say like, yeah, it's a uh, like you said, a Trojan horse or if it's going to be something that really is possible in the future. Um, there's a lot of factors to play. Okay. But but I mean, generally, going back to the nation state Bitcoin, I just want to have like your perspective, like, is that something positive, like long term? Would it be, you know, uh, smaller countries, bigger countries, like bottom up, top down approach or somewhere in the middle, the Bitcoin adoption of in different nations? I mean, you know, I'm not a big, big fan of nation state to be honest, or governments, but is that something like, could that like accelerate really this hyper Bitcoinization? Yeah, I guess somewhere in the middle, what I would say somewhere in the middle, uh, because if you look at it from the perspective of a smaller country, like El Salvador is doing, uh, yeah, you do make a lot of waves. And if mm -hmm. the price goes up, all of a sudden you have uh, a lot more uh, clout than you, you would have under any sort of a dollar based system where they're telling you how much dollars you have to buy and can hold or like these Central African countries, which, you know, I think still COVID actually interrupted their liberation process, but they were going to be freed from this, uh, you know, as a Central African 
franc and then the West African franc, they have the same exchange rate to the euro and they are mandated to hold a certain amount of French treasuries. Um, that was supposed to change in COVID. I don't think it's actually changed because of COVID. I don't think they can make it happen. But like these types of things, uh, it obviously seems good if you're a small state bank to the people and you could get your hands on some you know, neutral distributed money that no one can tell you you have to hold or you shouldn't hold or you know, the value is obviously going to increase as we as we know. So a, those are good things, right? I think those are good things. But then, you know, you have all the rest that we're dealing with that we don't like about the state that comes coupled up with that. So I think probably some some countries might turn out very well, like Switzerland you know, generally does. Uh, some countries might not, like North Korea continues to do. So maybe a middle middle ground type thing. I think that's a great point. I think the the countries that adopt Bitcoin the earliest, while we're still very, very early in the monetization phase, they're obviously going to do well, like El Salvador, like Guatemala, Honduras, like these other countries in Latin America that look like they're going to be very friendly to adopting Bitcoin. But I think overall, like hyper Bitcoinization is going to shrink the nation state. Um, so yeah, you're going to see these banks um, and you're going to see the BIS say, yeah, we're going to allow banks to hold one their reserves in bitcoin and you're going to see central banks eventually maybe start holding some bitcoin in their reserves uh, but I, I think overall hyper bitcoinization will dissolve the nation state so i think they'll be getting the the state the governments all around the world will definitely in my opinion i think they're certainly going to shrink in size just from bitcoin proliferating around the world yeah i think that's uh, that's very possible and i think very hopeful uh, that's what Bitcoin what we hope to do. And, you know, Satoshi himself said, you know, you can't expect all, uh, how did he say it in the early days? And you can't expect everything uh, politically to be solved by a technology, but it can certainly help. And um, I think that's, that's what we should look forward to. Um, let me ask you before I forget, uh, there is, uh, there was this announcement, uh, it was, a, you know, I think an official announcement uh, by the Russian government or, or, you know, that allegedly Putin said that from now on, you know, the, 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 this sort of the, the holdings or the gold reserve assets, uh, they're from now on classified or secret. I mean, does, does that change anything? Because what was it like totally public before then? Well, not really. Right. I mean, uh, do you know anything about that? Like, no, not really. Yeah. I mean, people argue about the state of the U S gold reserves. Right. They have it on their books. Uh, they have it at uh, still at the adjudicated uh, $42 an ounce. I'm already forgetting. $42 an ounce, I believe, uh, from the end of the uh, 60s, start of the 70s, when Bretton Woods basically collapsed. That's what they still value it on at on their books. Uh, but then, of course, everybody has speculated GATA being first and foremost uh, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, that gold, that uh, basically the the banks in conjunction with the Fed have lent out a lot of that gold, if not all of it, uh, to suppress the gold price. Uh, but at the same time, even though it's lent out, they still record it as a gold asset on their balance sheet, even though it's gold receivable. So that's a huge like red flag. I mean, it's not there. If it's, if it's not there, that's like a huge thing more for, I think the dollar than Russia, Russia's reserves are minuscule, uh, actually, uh, compared, compared to at least the, the, the dollar-based assets of the Federal Reserve, right? For right. this uh, 7 trillion, is it, over, is it even, is it, so it's over seven, I just didn't even know that right now, I'll look that up. Uh, many, many trillions, close to 10 trillion roughly, which is just insane, dollar central bank and the gold reserves of uh, Russian central bank, a couple hundred billion. Uh, it's absolutely, you know, not meaningless numbers, I mean, but, uh, those things will be tracked, by the way. Uh, there are many, I, I like to track some of that gold stuff. I get some of it from a very nice professional Australian gentleman. Actually, he's, he's kind of the, I think getting towards the end of his career, but he's, his name is Nick Laird. Uh, he's followed this stuff for many, many years, and he tracks a lot of the gold reserves, gold production values uh, independently. But then, of course, you have uh, the uh, gold, uh, gold, uh, World Gold Council, WGC, WGC World Gold Council, they track this stuff a lot. And they have made speculation, by the way, that Turkey is kind of uh, saying that they have more gold than they do. So they really have the pulse on that stuff. 
So, um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's all part and parcel of this whole story about Russia. Um, energy is a huge part of it. Uh, gold. Actually, I just, I just gave a tweet. I like to, you know, follow these numbers, numbers every once in a while. I just tweeted it just before the show. Um, let's talk about the value of some of these markets. Mm -hmm. Uh, and by the way, China's, like China's gold holding is also like shrouded in mystery. Like they talk, some, some people talk about like 20 or 30,000 tons. I mean, it's, it's like a total, yeah. like, yeah, mystery. Yeah. Yeah. yeah China holds um, 20, China's got about 20,000 tons. Yeah. Um, officially they say they've only got like 2000 or something really small. Their official holdings are like 2000 tons. But if you actually track the amount of gold they've imported since 2008, and you also track the amount of gold they've exported since 2008, it adds up to about uh, 20,000 tons. Cause the, the gold, the gold producers um, and miners in China, I think a large majority of them are mandated um, to not actually sell that gold and export it overseas. So uh, a lot of the estimates I've seen point to about 20,000. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. That's another, uh, uh -huh. exactly another example. I think uh, World Gold Council very much tracks and many other people in the market as well. So <laughs> yeah, it is a part of it. It's part of the story. Uh, they know that gold is, you know, historical based money. Perhaps it could have some, you know, this was of course before Bitcoin hype, I think. Uh, certainly it was before Bitcoin hype when Russia was trying to increase its gold holdings, China, uh, other countries as well. But um, yeah, I think overall energy is going to be a part of the stories. We know, I mean, we know the issues that Germany is having right now and uh, Russia has just shut off Nord Stream 1. Uh, so like, it, it's so interesting as well, living here in the Baltics, like we're, we've been like yelling about this stuff for like 20 years that Russia is just, it's not a democratic state. We bring them in. We're part of the G8, all of these things. We brought them to the table for years and years. And it's very unfortunate, um, because they do have their thumb on the energy pulse of Europe, Germany in particular. And it's very, very uh, in the short term, I think very bad for the German people, and it's not good for the Ukrainian people because they're getting whipsawed into this political, crazy, you know, neo-fascist agenda of Putin. But they they have their energy and you know their own families to worry about. So we have we have this divided support in Europe when where Eastern Eastern Europe is completely united. Like we are not going. You know, my relatives, my ancestors were under the Iron Curtain. Like we're not going back to that. We are not going back to that in Eastern Europe. So. Um, you know, you got the Baltics, Poland, uh, Czechs, Slovaks, uh, Hungary's a bit, you know, they're a bit not so democratic in certain ways with uh, Orban these days, but they're, they should be, um, I think they will come back into the fold there, but you know, the Croatians, all these countries, like we are not, we're just not going back to it. So, but anyway, I, I get on these, these tangents. I did want to, uh, say some numbers, uh, regarding total addressable market. I think this is just good for Bitcoin, but also you can see how big energy is. Um, so there's about three, 35 billion uh, barrels of oil per year that are consumed. So at a hundred bucks, uh, that's 35, sorry, $3.5 trillion, $3.5 trillion. That's the addressable market of oil per year, 3.5 trillion. Base money, uh, it's a change in base money that I tracked, 1.5 trillion. Uh, it's actually, it was, if you look the quarter before it was even 2 trillion. So it just depends on, you know, uh, depends on uh, exchange rate a lot for that 1.5 trillion gold, 200 billion only. It's about 115, 115 million ounces a year in, in new gold that comes online, uh, 200 billion and Bitcoin, 15 billion, $15 billion, only about 340,000 coins, uh, trailing 12 months. So that shows you how small from three and a half trillion oil, uh, to 15 billion Bitcoin. It just shows you how, it's how it's early we are. We are so early. <laughs> yeah, early, but also it's interesting, you know, Bitcoin's going to be a part of the energy grid. It always will, even if it has this sort of interesting dynamic where it takes energy that people don't want, even like, you know, renewable or flaring natural gas, the energy that people can't use or won't use or dissipates. Uh, Bitcoin's going to be a part of that energy story. And the world's got to figure out their energy needs. And it, that's a whole geopolitical thing that we're doing right now. I really hope that you know, Europe figures it out in the right way and Eastern Europe. BRICS, like, you know, Russia, China, and Saudi Arabia wants to join in. I mean, they want to like break away with their own currency, whatever that is. I mean, is that something like, did you see on the horizon, like accelerating suddenly uh, with the BRICS? Thing? What do you think? 
I don't know. Honestly, I don't Luke. <laughs> Look, can you hear us? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, I was just saying, uh, I think deglobalization is going to happen a lot quicker than most people think. Um, like, I think the BRICS nations, they house like 40% of the world's population. And they just came out this week and said, yeah, we're going to try to create a new reserve currency and we've all agreed to use it. Uh, so it's 40% of the world that's already said a massive F you to the dollar. Uh, I think that's interesting. Um, I am still a dollar bull. I'm still a dollar milkshake maximalist. I do think the US dollar is going to be the last fiat left standing purely due to the euro dollar market. Um, and I think as stable coins proliferate, US debt will still have some kind of demand. But um, I, I think, yeah, the BRICS nations is that's a very interesting development that happened this week. Right. Uh, we have about, I think you guys, also, both of you are somehow under time pressure. We have approximately eight minutes or 10 minutes. Uh, is it something like, you know, uh, makes you excited or um, bullish for, you know, let's say long term for the next couple of years? Well, I'm... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you go. You go. I, was, I was classman at straws as well. I, I was just saying... Um, I, I don't really want to say I'm bullish on the euro breaking down and hitting parity today against the US dollar because I think it is the first time in 20 years that the euro and the US dollar is one to one. But for me, it's kind of highlighting um, just how accelerated this fiat fiasco is collapsing. Uh, I think the European Union is still operating in negative, uh, negative yield territory while the US is aggressively raising interest rates. Uh, you're watching the Japanese yen lose 30% of its value against the dollar over the past six months. The euro has lost 20 to 30% of its value against the dollar in the past, you know, six to 12 months. I, I think it's just kind of highlighting how broken the fiat system is. Um, they can't normalize interest rates. They can't raise interest rates. We're living in the biggest debt Ponzi of all time. And I, I really, I think there's lots of indicators out there that show there's real stress in the system just from the US raising rates to what, they, what is it two percent is federal funds not even at two percent yet um like you're watching uh, liquidity in the mortgage-backed security market dry up you're watching liquidity in the treasury market dry up um i think it's just kind of highlighting that power's gonna have to pivot pretty shortly and and when he does and when it, when the money printers come on and if the us has to also try yield curve control like japan has tried and has failed in doing um i, I think it's going to really accelerate the timeline of everything and I kind of had the opinion for a long time, okay, maybe a slow transition's best. Maybe a slow and gradual transition is going to be the least chaotic and it's going to cause the least pain. But um, I think recently I was listening to Knut Svan Home and he raised some pretty good points about uh, ripping the Band-Aid off quickly and just completely transitioning onto a Bitcoin system because the longer we're using fiat, the longer um, the poor people in society are suffering from inflation and they're having their wealth stolen. If you somehow force them onto some sort of quasi-Bitcoin standard in the interim, um, or if you force the world onto a quasi-Bitcoin standard, I, I think it's going to be better for society and humanity. So I, I just, everything happening around the world um, looks like it's happening at an accelerated rate. And I suppose that makes me bullish because I see Bitcoin as the only viable solution. I agree, totally. <laughs> Matthew? Yeah, well put. Well put, man. Um, I just looked it up. I'm always um, thinking about the monetary base, the liability side, not the asset side. So it's, it's risen. Yeah, it always rises so quick every week. It's 8.89 trillion, 8.89 trillion in assets. Uh, again, the monetary base is the largest side of that uh, on the liability side. So it's, it's the sort of the main liability entry. Uh, there's other things on liability. There's other loans as well that they have uh, on the liability side. But the um, yeah, the, if you look at the asset side, it looks even crazier. Uh, eight, you know, nearly nine trillion dollars. Whereas uh, before uh, before the the COVID hit, it was going down from four and a half trillion. Four and a half trillion. It was on its way down. Um, actually, it was they they started printing a little bit before that. Uh, but they were trying to normalize it. Uh, and that's another interesting thing about money printing is we sometimes think about that. Uh, we sometimes hype it up and 
for a long time, the Federal Reserve was actually trying to go into Luke's point. Like, I think the reason why you see such a strong dollar is other central banks continue what they've always been doing, which hasn't worked, like Japan, like Europe. Uh, the Fed knew that it had the best looking horse in the glue factory. It was trying to normalize it best it could. It was trying to uh, let the rest of the inflationary markets that we live under, right? Because we don't live under Bitcoin standard. The rest of the inflationary markets catch up. Uh, it hadn't actually printed money before all this stuff, it, a little bit before COVID, but uh, it was mid-2014, mid-2014 on till about end of 2019, the Fed was not printing money. Monetary base was not increasing. Asset purchases were not increasing. So that's something that people don't think about a lot. Um, now, of course, it's back to the narrative and for all of us as, you know, Bitcoiners or anarcho-capitalist theorists or uh, classical liberals, whatever, we're happy to talk about the money printing again. And it, it is happening again in crazy, crazy uh, ways. But uh, yeah, the dollar is going to remain the best looking horse in the glue factory for a long time. Uh, I think what we were talking about earlier about uh, 12, 24 months can come at you really quick. And at that uh, time, the physical currency, which actually is a relatively stable kind of thing that's just according to the fungibility that we need today, when you only go down to two decimal points, you know, it is something that needs to increase with population, but it increases way faster than population. So all of these things are still going to happen on top of all of the stuff that Luke eloquently put out there. So I, I think that it all remains positive for Bitcoin. I just worry about sort of the geopolitical energy needs. Um, and I just hope that Europe in particular can stay sane on this, yes, I'm speaking from a biased position, speaking very close to what Russia is doing with Ukraine. Uh, but this is like, this is kind of a powder keg right now. And they really need to, uh, they, Ukraine needs to win, needs to win in Ukraine. And the rest of Europe needs to support them. And if they don't, I think you're going to continue to see extremely ugly things in the financial markets and in the energy markets um as it will take some sacrifice like we never thought we'd have to sacrifice anymore right uh we're in the great moderation like world days of yore of you know these backwards fighting nations in world war one and world war two were over i mean here we are again the same part of the world always you know disrupting <laughs> global markets and everything um it's definitely interesting but it, it for me it hits very close to home I'm a bit worried about it. I have a new baby daughter and congratulations. Uh, <laughs> serious. Oh, thank you. Yeah, she's a joy. But uh I mean I think as Bitcoiners it's great it's great to, to hodl and to accumulate. Um but I wouldn't be so quick to dismiss, you know, what the Western world continues to do and continues to be kind of a a light for democracy and we have to just keep that up because it's yeah. not getting any better in China. In China, by the way, the communist nation that it is uh, I told you about how bankers don't like, you know, they like profit. They might like socialized bailouts, but they're still capitalists, right, in the Western world. So that's why they don't like CBDCs. The one place where CBDCs might get legs is a place like China, where they're socialists and maybe yeah. they can nationalize, you know, 10 cents money, monetary production, whatever it is. Um, that might be the place to see it happen. And as we know, there's mm -hmm. not much transparency in China. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. But to be honest with you, I mean, existentially, I was just talking to my girlfriend, uh, my partner, you know, uh, the mother of our child, <laughs> um, that uh, a German EU commissioner just announced that, you know, people in Germany should prepare for, what does he say, like warlike economy or something like that, a war economy, something like that. So, you know, I mean, if we don't, you know, see, I mean, that could, you know, spill over very easily. I mean, I don't know how, how rational, logical or, you know, insane or sane people, the politicians or decision makers in Austria are. But I mean, they're already, you know, uh, um, a bunch of people, you know, economists, doctors, whatever, experts all over the place, you know, they come together and they've written a letter to the government and uh, saying, you know, stop this insanity, you know, because of this dependence on, on Russia's uh, energy. So I think we need some kind of, I don't know, energy independence or energy innovation, would it be nuclear technology? I'm a huge advocate, you know, you probably also are because it's the only rational thing. We need clean, super efficient, highly innovative and safe uh, nuclear uh, energy technologies. 
anyway, so we're seeing something on the horizon in this pain process, but let's see, you know, I'm hoping that everything sort of will transform into, into something positive. So, you know, we're seeing the pivot already uh, in Europe. We're already seeing the energy pivot. Uh, we don't have a power pivot. We've also got an ESG pivot. Uh, was it recently Europe? I'm not sure if I saw this correctly, but Europe started to classify natural gas and nuclear as quote unquote green technologies. Did I see that headline correctly? Um, but, you know, if, if if that's the case, it wouldn't surprise me at all because um, obviously they've tried to transition to this 100% uh, renewable green economy that Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum wants us to all be using, and Europe's the you know the the nation that's pursued that the most aggressively. And you've seen what's happened with electricity prices; they're up 300, 400, 500 percent. Gas is up 100, 200 percent, and now obviously the pain is too much. So, um, and that's kind of why they're talking about a war economy. Um, that's kind of what you get in a war economy and financial repression when governments have enormous debt loads. They they simply put the society and the economy into a state of financial repression. They keep interest rates low and you suffer from high inflation for five or 10 years while the government is able to pay back its debt with devalued inflated away dollars. Yeah. It's things are really unbelievable right now. I mean, right. I mean, I'm really feeling with the people because uh, there are a lot of, you know, pensioners or, you know, whether in Austria, Germany, but it's, let's just talk about Germany. Um, we live in Austria, but uh, they've already built facilities. You got to imagine they got to f they already f built facilities for the poor people because they they will not be able to afford heating, you know, uh, the energy. So uh, uh, it's I don't know what's coming, but it's it's really it's mind boggling if you think about it, right? Um, so they so the people you know have have some heated, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, all right. Uh, any final thoughts? Oh, by the way, yeah, just uh, maybe both of you, just where, where can people find you? Any Twitter handle, uh, website, podcast? Yeah, uh, so I'm co-host of the Bitcoin Made Simple podcast. Um, I always make educational videos as well as interviews on there. So uh, Kayvan, thanks again for having me, my friend. It's nice to see you again. And Matthew, nice to meet you for the first time. Congrats on the uh, new young born there. It's good to have another Bitcoiner with us. <laughs> absolutely thank you luke thank you luke thank you kayvon yeah i appreciate it guys uh yeah so crypto uh you can find your crypto voices.com or porkopolis.io uh doing crypto voices podcast still doing uh economic uh, uh stuff as well youtube videos starting shortly let's say um more than just the monetary based stuff that we've been doing uh so yeah i totally agree with all sentiments toward the end there guys it's it's definitely it's crazy that it's warlike times. Uh, it's absolutely war times for Ukraine. Try to support them as much as you can. Donate. Uh, if, you know, if, again, I'm selfishly part of this world, and this is like uh, absolutely talking my book here, but um, need to stand for personal sovereignty and liberty and like peace. Uh, those those are the things that are very very important right now. And absolutely, you know, you can donate in Bitcoin. Uh, it's very very easy to Ukraine. So, yeah. And, and what better time, you know, to connect and because we can only do this together. Uh, it sounds a little bit cliche, but <laughs> it's, we can only do this together. So, yeah, uh, well, it was really great, you know, getting a, a really deep insight into your thought process, perspectives, analysis and, and you know, uh, what you see on the horizon. So thank you so much again for your time. And yeah, talk to you soon, hopefully. All right. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye, Luke. Bye, Matthew. See you guys. Ciao.